Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. We are on season three, episode 11 of the series, Can You Believe It? I am your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. And now we get on to the main event. Uh, tonight we're joined by my colleague, Dr. Dr. Christian Brink, the Raptor and Large Terrestrial Bird Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa. He's responsible for managing a variety of BirdLife South Africa's species conservation projects. And previously he worked on the sub-Antarctic sub Marion Island where he monitored the seal, albatross and petrel populations for the Department of Environmental Affairs. Uh, Christian holds a doctorate degree in conservation biology and has a special fondness for birds of prey. You went on a a very exciting trip, uh, Christian, and we're all uh, waiting to hear what you have to say about it. So please uh, go ahead and share your screen and uh, take it away. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I have a lot to share with you, so I'm going to jump right in. But before we get to our main attraction, which is that beautiful bird over there, we're going to take a bit of a detour to a conversation uh, me and my dad had over a Sunday braai. And we were chatting um, about, I think, uh, a, a new species that had been discovered. And he was quite surprised and he said, is there even anything left to discover? And we sort of get lulled into this perception that our world is actually quite small because humans are everywhere, humans are everywhere and we are very uh, connected. Um, but um, there's so much we have left to discover. So my answer to him was yes, even in your own backyard. I mean, we don't have specialists uh, in every field, in every location. So of course, yeah, we, we don't get around to all the species. So the, the uh, screen there is just showing an extract from a paper where a new species of lichen was basically discovered by on a Facebook group, someone uploaded the picture of the lichen you took a photograph of uh, in Java and that ended up being a new species. And fine, you might say, well, these smaller microorganisms and things like lichens, you know, they're easily overlooked, but what about our larger uh, fauna and flora? Well, if we look at plants, the study by Cheek et al. sort of just showed uh, the number of species being described every year. And they could show that um, more than 2000 species of vascular plants are being described every year. Okay, but sure, those are plants. Not, there's not that many people that are into plants, uh, especially wild plants, but even our, our cute and fluffies, our mammals, uh, we're discovering new species. Since 1993, we've discovered uh, 408 new species, and you can see some of them on the left there, um, everything from bats to uh, sloth uh, to monkeys, um, so even some larger animals as well. And then, of course, we also have Lazarus species, uh, and those are species we thought were extinct, and then we rediscovered them. And of course, the most famous example of this is the coelacanth, but I'm just going to give you a few more that you might not have known about. Um, and uh, this is one, the tree lobster from Lord Howe Island. Now, this is a, a, a giant stick insect, basically. Um, and uh, rats were introduced to the island in 1918, and that led to the decimation of the stick insect uh, population. But they were rediscovered in, in the 1930s, uh, 1960s, on this sort of small pinnacle out in the sea. And a subsequent breeding program was started. And there you can see why they're called the tree lobster. They are gar gargantuan. Um, but of course, this is a bird talk. Um, and most of you would be interested in birds. So there's the example of the Bermuda petrel, which was thought to be extinct for uh, over 300 years. Um, it was basically eaten by early sailors as well as the hogs that were introduced to the island. But it was then rediscovered in 1951 uh, when a bird flew into a lighthouse, uh, leading to the dramatic rediscovery of 18 nesting pairs. And getting a little bit closer to our sort of study area uh, for tonight, uh, this study done by Conradi and et al, um, they basically surveyed the sky forest. So basically the forest on top of mountains in northern Mozambique. And they managed to record multiple species that haven't been recorded in that habitat, not new species, but also um, 
there's some populations of the species of, of that snake on the right there uh, that had previously not even been recorded in Mozambique. Um, so there's even um, unknown populations being discovered and uh, new distributions of species. And that brings us to our star of this evening, uh, these beautiful falcons on the screen over there. And um, I very much encourage you to also go look on YouTube at the Conservation Conversations um, that Anthony Fonsal and uh, Dr. Andrew Jenkins gave on the species. They went into a lot more detail about our population down in South Africa uh, and sort of the general biology of the bird. But they asked this question of whether this species is cryptic or is it critical? Um, basically asking whether, you know, it's a very rare species, a small population, scattered populations from Ethiopia down into South Africa, just these small pockets. And the question I asked was, is this bird just hard to see? They live high up on cliffs, they're very small. Are they in remote areas? Have they just not been recorded? Uh, and there's actually more out there uh, than we think. Or is it critical? Is this species highly endangered and uh, heading towards extinction? Very, very rare. Um, so I, I encourage you to go watch that talk. Um, and uh, tonight we're going to give a little bit more information uh, to start working at that puzzle. So just a quick general overview of the species. This is a very small bird. Um, they also have small territories um, and they specialize in hunting birds, small birds. Um, they, their habitat is cliffs overlooking dense bushveld or woodland, uh, most notably river, uh, river and gorges that was sort of thought to be the, the typical habitat uh, for tighter falcons. And the reason we're interested in them um, beyond just being a very interesting species uh, is that in South Africa, they're critically endangered. Um, the IUCN currently lists them as being vulnerable. But uh, in fact, we know very little about the species, um, very little about its ecology, uh, its population, its distribution. There's still a lot to learn about it. Um, but the current guesstimate at the population size is 500 to 1,000 mature individuals. Um, but um, we have less than 50 known breeding sites uh, in the world. Um, and yeah, the two best studied populations are the Patoka Gorge population in Zimbabwe, and of course, our Blyder River Canyon population down in South Africa. Unfortunately, uh, both these populations seem to be winking out, um, or at least the prognosis doesn't look good. Uh, during the last survey, the Batoka Gorge uh, populate, uh, during the last Batoka Gorge survey, only a single bird was spotted. And during our last uh, Blyder River Canyon survey, we only recorded four active territories with a single um, site seeing to produce chicks. And that's down from, I think, uh, a maximum of eight active territories um, in a year. Um, so given um, these concerns, uh, or at least uh, the rareness of the Taito Falcon, the Taito Falcon project was started um, by BirdLife South Africa. Well, sorry, Andrew Jenkins started it way back when. Um, and since then, uh, BirdLife South Africa has gotten involved uh, as well and um, have uh, Andrew Jenkins and Anthony Fonsale as our species guardians um, for the species. They, the, the falcon experts in South Africa as well. So the goal of the project was to conserve tighter falcons and their habitats. And uh, the ways we uh, went about or want things we needed to do to do this was first of was to accurately determine the conservation status. Now that involved identifying and monitoring populations as well as then identifying and mitigating the threats to these populations. And to get to that, we also needed to determine what the habitat requirements of the species is. So that's the goals for the project, project broadly. So given um, what I've described uh, about those two populations, we in 2021 held a Taito Falcon workshop and sort of pooling the expertise uh, from uh, Southern Africa. We had uh, representatives from BirdLife Zimbabwe, um, as well as um, just um, uh, private experts, I guess we would call them, the BirdLife team. And then we also managed to recruit, uh, or not recruit, get uh, Rick Watson to join the call 
from the Peregrine Fund, uh, who have previously been involved in some type of falcon work, but they also had um, run a similar conservation project on orange-breasted falcons, which is very much a sort of species uh, in a similar situation and has a lot of similarities uh, to the title falcon, so we could draw on that. But what came out of this uh, workshop, we realized that the main priority currently is for us to identify if there are any other strongholds for the, for the species further afield, uh, where they might be um, more adequately protected and more likely to persist. Um, and for a very long time, Niasa um, has been suspected that it could hold a, a much larger tighter falcon um, population. And this was suggested as a site, a survey site. And uh, we're very thankful to the Peregrine Fund uh, who then gave us a grant to go do the survey. Now, the reason we, uh, it was suspected that Nyasa uh, is a likely location, uh, Nyasa Special Reserve in Northern Mozambique, is because there are three historic nesting sites in the area and they've just been recorded around areas uh, where there's a lot of human activity. Um, but it's also um, a large expanse of suitable habitat. So you can see there on the screen, it's pretty much a sea of Miombo woodland uh, with these inselbergs dotting across the landscape. And of course, each one of those inselbergs is a potential nesting site and a potential uh, tidal falcon territory. Um, so huge percent potential in the landscape. So having secured the grant, uh, we needed to start planning. Uh, so we got into contact with um, uh, management um, at, of, of the reserve. Um, and the reserve is run uh, by um, the Wildlife Conservation Society, as well as the um, Mozambican government. Uh, so the Wildlife Conservation Society is assisting there. And so I contacted uh, the field operations manager, Peter Trevor, and we started discussing uh, the project. Um, and it turned out that they would be, have a helicopter at the end of November stationed at Mbatamila, um, sort of the main operational um, camp or headquarters of Nyasa uh, at the end of November because they were doing some elephant uh, coloring which was ideal for us because that's sort of the timing we would have wanted to go uh, survey for these falcons. We generally in South Africa survey year in December. Um, so we try and catch them late in the season uh, when there's a lot of big fat chicks on the nests making a lot of noise or a lot, and a lot of fledglings flying about stretching their wings and just generally a lot of activity around the nests making the birds much more conspicuous. So we had the helicopter, we knew when we were going to get there and we, know, we knew how we were going to get around. Of course, this is one advertised as one of the last two wilderness areas in Africa. So the road network is quite limited and that's why we needed the helicopter as well um, to cover um, a large area in a, in a short amount of time. We only had left roughly 10 days within which to conduct the survey. So then I went ahead and uh, did some recruitment and um, managed to uh, recruit the esteemed gentleman shown uh, in this picture. So that was our team. Uh, we have David Allen uh, on the left, then there's me, Neil Deacon, uh, then we have Carl Walker, and then Anthony, uh, Andrew Jenkins and Anthony from Sale. Um, our species guardians, and uh, all these gentlemen are raptor biologists in their own right, uh, although they might also have other expertise, uh, some of them as their day jobs. Um, but yeah, I have to say, I couldn't have wished for a more enthusiastic uh, and experienced team. Um, pretty much everyone in that team had previous experience uh, in surveying for tiger falcons. I I think I was pretty much uh, the most novice of, of all of them, which is, uh, was a good thing. So then we went on with all the preparations, which, yeah, of course, was a lot of paperwork and managing logistics of getting there. Um, and with Peter Trevor from Wildlife Conservation Society assisting in some of that organization. So I'm very thankful to him uh, for answering the barrage of questions. Um, and then there were also some safety concerns that we had to consider, uh, as you can see from this map in 2021 when we did the survey, 
uh, there was still quite a bit of uh, terrorism or insurgent attacks in northern Mozambique and neighboring province of Cabo Delgado. Um, all those purple dots are basically attacks. Um, and so we consulted with some security specialists as well as people on the ground. Um, and although there were some warnings, uh, the general consensus was that it's safe for us to come. So we uh, ended up going ahead and uh, having uh, done all the paperwork, uh, we started designing the survey or planning the survey. Um, and we had to figure out where are we going to search for these falcons. And luckily, from some um, research we've done on the South African population and some modeling, we knew that the uh, Tata Falcon occupancy or the presence of Tata Falcons was positively associated with woodland and negatively associated with woodland fragmentation. And then we also don't find uh, titers where there's already uh, e e existing land of falcons. Um, and they seem also to prefer large cliffs or associated with larger cliffs. So using this information, we went on to Google Earth and identified all the Inselbergs surrounding Mbatamila, which is going to be our home base. So this picture shows Nyasa as the grayed out area. And then those circles are just the 25, 50 meter, uh, kilometer and 75 kilometer boundaries around Mbatamila. Of course, we had to focus in that area, flight time being very expensive and eating most of the budget. Um, we had to yeah, focus within uh, a certain radius area. And then each one of those dots is an Inselberg that we viewed in Google Earth. Um, and basically, based on that visual observation, uh, looking at things like how, how sheer the cliffs looked and how big the Inselberg looked, we sort of graded them from red being uh, what seemed to be the most suitable to orange and then to green being the least suitable um, based on those observations. So with a plan, uh, off we went, uh, and this is our first meeting at Mug and Bean, the team assembling. And <laughs> they might not look at in this photograph, but uh, everyone at that table was as giddy as schoolboys school for this adventure, I can tell you. Uh, so from there, from South Africa, we flew to Maputo, um, and then to Nampula, and from Nampula to Lechinga, uh, where we met our driver at the small African airport. Um, and yeah, he showed up with uh, Toyota Fortuna for the six of us and all our gear, uh, and of course himself included. Luckily, I had some rope so we could tie down some of it on the roof rack. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was tight. It was a tight squeeze, uh, with people having luggage on their laps, underneath their legs. And uh, we then set off on what ended up being the 10 hour drive through rural Mozambique. Um, and I think the trip can pretty much be summed up uh, by the expressions uh, of these two gentlemen, Anthony on the left there and uh, Neil on the right. Um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a trying trip and uh, we managed to get to Mbatamila in the dark and sort of knocked on doors to find a way to uh, where we'd be staying, which is in sort of the staff camp at Mbatamila. And the next morning, uh, before first light, Anthony was already there scouting out the Inselberg where we knew there was a historic nest site. And he managed to find our first falcon. Uh, lo and behold, uh, there's a tighter falcon um, chick sitting in the nesting pot hole there. Um, a lot of, you'll see most of the tighter falcon photographs they've taken with cell phones through scopes because that's sort of how far away they were. Fortunately, it's quite difficult to get good photographs. So on that first day, we were also lucky with the Wildlife Conservation Society assisting us in doing a fixed wing airplane sort of scouting reconnaissance mission. Uh, and we flew, you see on the left there, that black uh, track. That's uh, sort of uh, how we flew, three of us. Um, basically, um, trying to ground truth our perceptions of the various Inselbergs, um, looking for um, sheer cliffs and signs of uh, falcon uh, whitewash, um, so pretty much the stains left by falcons def defecating from their perches. And this was hugely useful uh, to, to our survey. 
Um, and what follows is just some aerial photos uh, to show you the landscape. There you can see that sea of Miombo woodland, uh, which is pretty much a uh, habitat type that's dominated by the um, presence of Brachystegia species of trees. I probably pronounced that wrong. They don't teach us Latin anymore in uh, undergrad zoology. Um, but yeah, this woodland um, also extends from Angola in the west in the broad band all the way through to Tanzania in the east. And uh, this landscape is also has, like I said, these Inselbergs jutting out. Now, Inselberg is a German word that basically means uh, island mountain. Um, and you can see why uh, Inselberg is pretty much this mountain um, sticking out out of a, 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 flat, a flat surrounding landscape. And they basically form because the Inselberg itself is more resistant rock and then there's deferential erosion and um, the surrounding geology is sort of eroded away, leaving um, the, the, the more resistant rock behind, uh, which are these pinnacles. So there's just some uh, more aerial photos. You can see Inselberg stretching on into the horizon. There we have Andrew updating some notes on the Inselbergs as we flew. I have to say, I got quite motion sick on that tiny little aircraft. It was about a three hour flight. There's also photos of the main river, the Legenda River that runs through that area. And then of course we get to the surveying part. So basically what we did is we parked in front of the Inselberg and uh, everyone had binoculars and spotting scopes, usually in teams of two or three. Um, and um, someone would be watching the cliff with binos uh, and the air looking for falcons flying in while someone would be scouting the cliff face with that spotting scope. And that's sort of how, how we uh, went about it. Um, we'd also be looking for, of course, the signs of falcons or uh, good nesting uh, structures, such as you can see there, Carl staring at uh, some lovely little overhangs and potholes um, on that cliff face with some nice whitewash. Um, and I have to also mention Cliff uh, Carl was our our very best spotter. He spotted, well, he spotted the falcons first, usually. Uh, whether that has got something to do with him being the youngest member in the team, I'm not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, he, he was a great uh, spotter to have in the team. And then the surveying was quite hard work. Uh, this is a bit of a tongue in cheek photo. Andrew's just quickly resting his back for a little bit from all the craning your neck, looking up um, at that rock face right in front of us. Uh, we usually got up, you know, uh, before light, um, trying to be at the, the helipad uh, as it gets light so that we can pretty much when the pilot's ready to, to fly, we can fly off for the morning session, surveying two teams getting dropped, different locations. And then in the afternoon session, we'll try and stay out as late as, as the pilot allows us uh, with the light fading before coming back in. It was also at Moses Northern Mozambique. Uh, it was quite hot, um, very hot in fact. Usually you shower and by the time you finish drying your hair, you've already sweated again. Um, so quite hot and we also had some interesting critters about. Um, luckily, there were very few uh, tsetse flies. Uh, I think only one or two of us got bitten. Um, but there were these Mopani flies who are at first very endearing characters. Um, and they're actually a stingless bee. Um, and they have a very uh, aromatic smell, perfume-like smell. Um, inevitably, you do squish some of them and it's this butter popcorn smell. It's actually lovely, but they go after all the moisture um, they can find so that's uh, basically they're climbing to your eyes and the corners of your eyes into your nose uh, into your ears um, so I mean they climb underneath that buff that buff was pretty much useless so while you're trying to scope out uh, a cliff uh, it becomes quite difficult so yeah we also had the chopper assisting us um, and that was a great help um, it allowed us to sort of circle around Inselbergs, find the most active looking cliffside before touching down and setting up um, to survey. 
also allowed us to access areas that we wouldn't have otherwise. Like here, we parked on a, a na to the top of a neighboring Inselberg and we managed to scan in that one. Fortunately, I think that one had land of falcons on. Usually we'll survey until we either see um, tides of falcons and we know they're there and whether they're breeding. And then we'll move on to the next, to try and survey as many Inselbergs as possible. Or if we found another one of the larger falcons already occupied that Inselberg, we'll move on as well. We had to do a little bit of walking on foot uh, and trekking through the bush. So we're grateful to have had our two guides, uh, Casimira and George on the right there. Um, these guys look intimidating, um, but they were very sweet. They actually taught us a bit of uh, Portuguese as well. Uh, but yeah, there's quite a language barrier in Northern Mozambique. Uh, and yeah, they were just there. I mean, it's big, big five countries. So uh, it was... Uh, good to have them uh, with us out there in the bush. Um, and then, yeah, it's quite difficult surveying what's sometimes or daunting, uh, a huge slab of, of cliff and the falcons are quite small, so they can be very, very hard to spot. So I don't know if you can see the two falcons um, on the left there. I realize now that I missed the second falcon when I actually indicated the one, but you'll see that there's another one over here as well. I should have circled that one. But yeah, that's through a telescope um, that, that you can um, sort of miss them. Luckily, they fly about and that movement is usually how we pick them up. So yeah, just to show you sort of the scale of some of those Inselbergs or cliffs, that's the helicopter. Um, and on the left is a rock face we wanted to survey. Um, this dramatic photo taken by Andrew Jenkins. Um, and yeah, I just have to mention uh, David Allen. He he was probably the best scoper. Um, he's pretty much an artist or a painter when it comes to scoping. Uh, with his scope being his brush and like his the rock face being his canvas, and he he ends up coloring every inch of of that rock face. So a very dedicated uh, a scoper, David. There's just another one, see if you can spot the falcon. This one's actually much easier sitting um, to uh, 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 back on a black rock in the tree there. Yeah, and so we, we surveyed for roughly uh, seven days. And during that time, uh, Andrew and I got the chance to be flown to Maruri Environmental Center, which is where the Carnivorous Dorni Yasa uh, project uh, is run by Keith and Colleen Begg. Um, and they kindly uh, assisted us, uh, Keith uh, sharing us a, a, around a little bit. And he told us a story about this one Inselberg on top of which they usually stood scanning for um, honey badgers. And he's seen a title like falcon flying about there. So we ended up going to look and we arrived uh, at the front of it, got out of the car. And you already had the, the scope up by the time I was still climbing out. And uh, within 30 seconds, he said, there it is. Just showing you how easy surveying can be sometimes. So we're zooming in there and there you can see a small uh, young falcon uh, on a nesting ledge as well. So discovering a new, a new nest site uh, that was previously not known or, or recorded before. So just have to also highlight some other great work being done in the area. Uh, we part some bees nests and trees, which are part of Prof. Claire's Spotters Wood from the Fitzpatrick Institute. It's part of their uh, African Honey Guides project, um, where they're looking at the mutualism between honey guides and uh, human uh, honey collectors. I advise you to go have a look at their website, some very interesting work they're doing. But yeah, then uh, our helicopter time ran out, um, it ate through the budget, and um, luckily, um, Willem Kleinald, um, the logistics manager at Mbat Mila, was able to organize for us uh, to go to Legenda Wilderness Camp. We we're very grateful to him uh, for all the effort he also put in. We constantly <laughs> made his life difficult while being there with requests. And so, uh, yeah, we were also excited to go to the agenda because there on the top left, you can see there's these big Inselberg complexes in that area and we could access some of them by road. Um, we were also excited because this is a five star lodge uh, and we were used to the operational camp, which was a bit more simplistic living. You know, that, for instance, is a, a, a typical meal. Um, 
which was very tasty and adequate, but it was a, st a staff camp. And uh, when we arrived here, we had buffets. And the um, thing I was most excited about was ice and refrigerated drinks. Uh, we, we had been drinking warm water for the most of the trip. There wasn't such facilities as at Mbatamila. So this was complete luxury for us. And we managed to survey uh, a bunch of additional um, Inselbergs while there. Um, and yeah, this is just uh, a photograph of me, Neil and David at the very last Inselberg we surveyed. And as you can see from those smiles, we yet again discovered another uh, uh, Taita Falcon uh, territory. So yeah, that was a good way for at least three of us to end the survey. Uh, I think the others weren't as lucky. Um, but yeah, it was a great way to end the survey. Um, yeah, and we ended up just in time, unfortunately, um, just at the end of our survey, uh, two days after people were evacuated out of the area, uh, there was some insurgent activity and they had the red dot. Apparently there, uh, there was uh, a bit of an issue. Um, so yeah, we're glad the whole team got out safely. Um, subsequent discussions with reserve management seems like this issue has now been squashed and uh, everything's under control. Um, so that's also very good news. Um, and getting to the most exciting part of the talk, the results. Um, on the left there, you can see all the Inselbergs that we surveyed also. This is, everyone pay attention. This is where the answer comes in to the question asked. Um, so we surveyed for roughly 10 days and we spent more than 80 hours uh, watching cliffs. Um, that's without sort of the scouting and flying and, and all of that transit time. Um, and we surveyed 34 Inselbergs and managed to discover the largest known population of Titan Falcons. Um, so 41% of the surveyed Inselbergs had titles. Um, and we discovered 14 occupied territories, about half of which had breeding birds. Um, and we saw a total of 37 Taita falcons um, while on the trip. So yeah, I, our, our Taita falcon expert, uh, Andrew Jenkins, um, was uh, hoping to find 10 territories. Uh, and we very much exceeded that. So excellent result on the survey and we're very uh, excited about this result. So our conclusion is that Nyasa is a stronghold for Titus and perhaps the entire Northern Mozambique region. So why I say that, and this is still speculation, but you can see that red dot up there, that's Nyasa and down on the right there is Nampula. And the Titus Falcons have been seen in Nampula around the airport. And there's a big complex, or there's a lot of uh, Inselbergs, similar type of landscape as well in that area. And that sort of landscape also extends up into Tanzania. So there's lots of potential uh, for, for titers in this area. And of course, we also recorded a couple of other birds. Um, and it just also showed how little sort of AU faunal surveying have been done in the region, for instance, on the right there is the uh, IUCN distribution for Southern Band Snake Eagles. And on the left there, you can see, we saw Southern Band Snake Eagles photo of one uh, through a scope. Uh, so they definitely also occur in the reserve. Um, and we recorded 178 uh, species in total, um, as well as some which are apparently new records for Niassa. Um, and I think those were Abbott Starlings, Aries Hawk Eagle, Mocking Cliff Chats, Narina Trogan, and Western Barn Owl, but I'm not 100% sure. But being a, a raptor enthusiast myself, my favorites were the Auger Buzzards and the Dickinson's, the Dickinson's Kestrel, uh, which are lifers for me, and other great birds that I hadn't seen before were Livingston's Flycatcher, Racketail Roller, Arnott's Chats, and Pale Build Hornbills. So a very exciting trip all in all. But the trip did raise some questions. Um, most notably, what is typical Taita Falcon habitat then? Um, we thought it was these riverine gorges such, such as Blyder River Canyon and um, Patoka Gorge, but perhaps this Inselberg landscape is, is more typical Taita Falcon habitat 
um, which raises some interesting ecological questions. You know, are, is the SA and Zimbabwe population perhaps more fringe populations? Um, and there's also the questions we need to explore more. Another important question was how safe is the tiger falcon population in Yasa? Because Nyasa has a lot of pressure. There's more than 40,000 people living in the reserve in villages such as this. It's a wilderness area. There's not hard boundaries or, or uh, fences uh, with the reserve. And so people utilize the resources in the park, unfortunately, in an unsustainable matter, so, uh, manner. So it threatens biodiversity in the park. And the important threats in the area includes things like artisanal mining, poaching, illegal logging, uh, land clearing for agriculture, expanding settlements, snaring, unmanaged fire, retaliatory uh, killings of predators and elephants. And a lot of these um, are mainly driven um, by external markets, mostly in East Asia, uh, and poor governance and weak law enforcement um, are, are also local drivers that allow these illegal activities to, to thrive in northern Mozambique. Of course, it's a very remote area, so it's, it's, it's quite challenging, and, and uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Mozambique government pretty much have their hands full in trying to, to rectify that. Um, and just as an illustration, um, they lost about 70%, or Nyasa lost about 70% of the elephants um, in less than two decades um, due to poaching. And we also saw... Um, some examples, you know, of snares being taken out and, and sort of poachers being arrested. So the human impact there is very real. Um, and you can see, for instance, you know, fires in foreground and far background. Um, there was a lot of fires being so seen. Apparently, coal production is also an issue. And on the right there, you can see sort of clearing of woodland for agriculture happening as well. Um, so those are things you, you, you see around the park. So our next step, well, we want to engage with role players um, in, uh, that are already he heavily invested in that area, guys like the Wildlife Conservation Society, Carnivora Dorn Yasa, uh, to basically put tighter falcons on their priority list and to at a minimum protect those woodland surrounding uh, areas where we know uh, tighter falcons or where we recorded tighter falcons. And then we we'll also now need to rethink what is suitable habitat for the species and sort of explore that uh, because that will also help us get to estimated population size. Um, so those who have seen a lot of conservation conversations, you know, um, habitat suitability modeling is one good way uh, to get at some of that. Um, so basically we just take environmental uh, spatial data, things like climate and land cover. Um, and then we use our occurrence data um, in a model, and what the model basically does, it, see, it, it looks at what the local conditions are where we've recorded tighter falcons previously, and then it makes a prediction about the suitability of uh, habitats uh, through a larger landscape. And what we get is a result such as that one on the left, which is based on the Blyder River Canyon occurrence data, um, and just for uh, South Africa. And what we now need to do is incorporate this, these, the information from our NIASA survey to come up with a, a much larger one for a regional one for the um, larger range of the tight falcons. And then what we can do is we can identify cliff sites using a digital elevation model, basically just a satellite flying over and measuring the distance to the ground. So you get a profile um, of the topo 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 topography. Uh, and from that, we can extract slope, um, which is there on the right. And then above the certain threshold of slope, we can assume it's cliffs. So that's how we can identify cliff sites in the landscape and in Sulbergs. And then we can look at internet dif uh, distances uh, and results from the survey to infer a, a population size for the larger area and using both of those information sets. And yeah, through this survey and this work, we hope uh, we have shed new light on um, what we know about tighter falcons and that, that this will very much help contribute to their conservation and the future planning of tighter falcon conservation. And then I just need to thank a range of people. Uh, they're all listed there on the screen. First off, 
the team that uh, were involved in surveying and, you know, um, uh, our species guardians, Andrew and Anthony, as well as the volunteers, Carl, David and Neil, um, a tremendous effort from their, their part. Um, thank you very much for all your assistance uh, and being involved. Um, it was great having you on the team. And then uh, assistance from a range of other people who are listed there from Wildlife Conservation Society, Peter Trevor and Willem Kleinov, our pilots, the Mumbai Mela management staff, the Gender Wilderness Camp management staff, our guides again, and then Keith and Colleen Begg, as well as our main donor from the Peregrine Fund uh, and Rick Watson for, for pushing that. Um, as well as more our long-term, some of our long-term donors on the, the Tiger Falcon project, uh, Beth Hackland, and uh, some donations as well from uh, Forever Resorts. Um, then I also need to thank the Angula Partnership, which who pretty much sponsor my position. So thank you very much to everyone there. And then thank you to you, the listeners. I hope you found that uh, exciting. Um, uh, I very much appreciate you being here, um, taking the time to, to listen to me uh, tell uh, stories. Um, and yeah, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Wow, Christian, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, such a, a great adventure that you went on and uh, also uh, great for conservation of the species. Um, I've had a, a sneak preview of your your results during our BirdLife South Africa staff meeting, but it was great to get the full story and all your your anecdotes and and uh, hearing hearing everything that that went on during that survey and how amazing uh, it must feel to to have discovered the largest type of population. <laughs> um, but yeah, still some work to be done uh, to try and make sure they're protected. So well done and thanks very much for that. Thanks. And uh, yeah, there are some questions coming in. So if anyone else has questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box. Um, so we'll start with uh, Rob Simmons asking about the interactions between lanners and titans. So saying if there are lanners at the, the same Inselberg, are they driving away the titans? Yeah, so I mean, they, they're territorial uh, raptors, both species, so they compete for nesting sites and things. So our assumptions were that, you know, if we, we find titers or lanners on a cliffside, that we there will be no other birds, uh, none of, not conspecific, nor the other species. But interestingly, there was one Inselberg, where, which was quite a longer Inselberg, but we had titers around the front, and far along this side, there were some lanners as well, which was a very interesting observation for us. They're probably partitioning sort of their hunting areas, um, but in general, you know, they're territorial, so they'll 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 compete. Um, but yeah, we didn't witness any any interactions between um, the different falcon species. We did, however, witness some very dramatic interactions uh, with titus bombing auger buzzards or, or crows. Um, or ravens, um, and yeah, Neil was flabbergasted at the, he's a falconer, and he was flabbergasted, flabbergasted at just their, their, their flight performance, they're amazing little birds, they just, uh, such impressive stoops, even climbing straight up, they, they're very impressive flyers, I have to say, they, they quickly at least became my favorite falcon, if not one of my favorite raptors. Hey. So kind of linking to that flight behavior and, and Penny asks whether you saw any differences in hunting techniques between the falcons in Mozambique compared to the ones in the riverine gorges. Did you get an, any sense of that? Yeah, so not really, I think. Uh, I have to also uh, say that that's the type of question we have to defer to, to guys like Andrew Jenkins. I've only been on one uh, survey at Blyder River Canyon. Um, but in terms of the hunting, um, they like hunting off of their cliff perches, but they also do uh, typical falcon soaring, uh, climbing up and then stooping down, smashing something as well as a little bit of a sort of a hawking foray after insects, apparently. Um, and I believe that's, that, that's similar hunting strategies to, to what we've seen at Blyder. Um, so yeah, very much similar, 
similar hunting strategies, I would say, I think, as well as, yeah, same specialization on birds as well. Okay. Um, and another one from Penny, she's put a few questions in. Um, and I think this one relates to uh, your um, kind of Google Earth mapping exercise of identifying Inselbergs um, compared to what you saw on the ground. So she's asked, it seems therefore the mapping techniques are highly successful. So I think that was, uh, that she put that question in when you were showing your map of where you found the titers. Um, so was your, was your kind of Google Earth ex, uh, sort of exploration um, accurate in where you found that ended up finding them? Well, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot more Inselbergs that we identified in Google Earth than what we actually managed to survey. I mean, a lot of them are also, we, we thought, less likely. So we focused on the ones that looked the most likely. So, um, yeah, I mean, Google Earth was, um, as a starting point, quite accurate. But there were a lot of Inselbergs that we updated through that reconnaissance flight, as well as throughout the survey in transit with the helicopter. Um, some of them look very dramatic on, on Google Earth, and then when you actually see them, it's not a sheer cliff, it's more of like a sloping dome. Um, so there were cases where, you know, Google Earth wasn't sufficient to give the right uh, information, but in general, it was very useful um, most of the time. Um, and now another one from Rob Simmons. Um... <laughs> This might be uh, part of uh, what you what you're planning with the habitat mod modeling, but uh, if you were ex to extrapolate from the densities in the optimal habitat to similar hab habitat in Mozambique and Tanzania, uh, do you have any idea of what the estimated population would be? <laughs> yeah, so, so trust Rob to ask the difficult <laughs> questions. Um, that is, yeah, the next work that I need to do. Um, so it would be uh, firstly identifying those Inselbergs throughout the landscape. So that's the last part I talk, talked about. Like I first need to get a good idea of the amount of Inselbergs and suitable Inselbergs with sufficient sort of slopes. Um, and then we can start extrapolating. So the idea is to get an idea of where there's similar habitat and then look at the amount of Inselbergs within that habitat. And then we do that extrapolation. So I'm not gonna put my head on the block uh, throwing wild guesses uh, at this, this point. Okay, fair enough. Uh, we'll let you do do the work, and then you can come and give us another presentation later on. <laughs> sure. um, then uh, Penny again asks whether there are any records of tiger falcons at Ruaha. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right in Tanzania. Uh, do you know anything about their distribution up in that part of the world? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um... Andrew, them, I actually have it as a spare slide down here. I had actually an excellent map. <laughs> uh, I think I'm still sharing, which shows yes, a are. lot of the populations. Um, let's see what's on the Tanzania, at least one pair. Yeah, I sure have to judge by that dot whether that's close to the area she's thinking of. But I think, yeah, it seems like there's only a single uh, recorded pair in, uh, in Tanz Tanzania. Okay, well, maybe you can go there next and, and do a survey. <laughs> um, then uh, Gaynor Donovan, uh, I think, asking uh, with a view to an next birding trip, <laughs> um, great news from Mozambique, but is there anywhere in South Africa where they can still be fairly reliably seen, um, which are accessible to the public? Yeah, um, I mean, it used to be the Australian Tunnel site um, where they're easily seen. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think which sites are sort of very accessible by the public. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think you'll, you'll have to just uh, go explore Bladder River Canyon and, and keep an eye out. I think at... Um, What's it? Um, the, one of the Forever Resorts. I think this is not Sengueti. Oh my word, I forgot their name. Um, but the Forever Resort that's sort of in that bowl surrounded by cliffs. Uh, if you keep an eye on the cliffs, uh, you might be able to spot them there. Uh, so that's a good place to, to go have a holiday and take your scope with um, if you're looking for them. Yeah. 
Um, now, here's an interesting question from Tuonge. Sorry if I've uh, said that wrong, but uh, what time of year did you do the surveys? Uh, they are planning to do surveys in uh, Malawi. Um, okay. So maybe okay, you so should get in touch. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So we, we went in November, like I said, our, uh, last year, November. So the South African population, that's very late in the season or, or sort of in the, the later end of the season when all the chicks are nice and big and the fledglings are flying about, um, mostly December. But what we found in Nyasa was that we only saw one chick on the nest and that one fledged while we were there. In November and the rest were all fledglings already flying about so it seems like they may be breeding early, earlier um, up north um, so that's something to keep in mind and yeah so she's welcome to drop me an email and we we can discuss it a little bit further. Yeah great that does seem like something that uh, you could collaborate on um, then uh, Gordon Holtman asks um, whether it would be possible to establish new populations in South Africa somehow using the Mozambican populations. Yeah, that is a that is an interesting question. It's also, uh, yeah, it is an interesting question. So we <laughs> we always want to try and conserve the birds in the natural habitat. As soon as you start looking at ex situ conservation efforts, things like cat breeding and release, it's uh, that sort of the dire straits type of thing. There's just the, the money investment into that, uh, as well as sometimes the rate of success. Uh, I know the orange breasted falcon, that strategy didn't go that well. Um, so it's something we generally want to avoid. We'll rather uh, keep them, uh, safeguard them in their natural habitat. Um, I mean, the other areas, I think, are habitat suitability, suitability models for South Africa, I think, highlighted the Waterberg, for instance, um, a bit more north. So, I mean, potentially there are sites, but like I said, we also have to look closely at uh, that information uh, at, at this survey and we think perhaps uh, and test what, what the ideal habitat for the species is. Um, and it all depends on sort of the nature of our population as well. Um, so it's something we have to think carefully about. Um, uh, uh, the focus, let me put it this way, should probably be protecting them in that stronghold in the Asa, uh, which seems like it's probably a core population and might even be the origin of our populations, you know, birds coming down and establishing here. But that's very much speculation on my part at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. It's always best to to leave them in, in the wild um, rather than try and do a whole captive breeding and, and reintroduction. Um, now, while you have the, the map up on screen, uh, Eddie asks about Taita falcons in the Taita Hill area of southeastern Kenya. I would imagine that there would be some link. Um, yeah, so that's where the species was first described. So that's why it's called the Taita falcon. We uh, we sort of jokingly uh, debated to start a petition to to rename it the Nyasa, the Nyasa falcon, rather, since you know there's there's only been very small you know record or few recordings uh, in that area where we found this large population in Nyasa. Um, so hashtag Nyasa falcon. Um, <laughs> kidding, um, but yeah, that's just where the bird was first described, um, and that's why it's called the. Taita falcon or Taita falcon, as some people pronounce it. Okay. Um, and then another one from Rob. Uh, are you considering any genetic studies uh, to have a look at the viability of this uh, apparently tiny population? You could look at molted feathers, for example. Yeah, so that's something we, we've discussed uh, loosely. It would be hugely interesting. Um, I mean, also to see, you know, uh, it would answer a lot of questions potentially of the origin of the populations, their relatedness. If there's any gene flow, that would be very interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. It's just quite hard to get at them. Um, you know, you need to uh, abseil down to a nest uh, or something to do it. It's not impossible, um, but it is something we have discussed and would be hugely beneficial. Yeah, yeah, it's hugely interesting and, and important for the, the conservation as well. 
to preserve the genetic diversity as well as um, the individual birds. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, especially since with um, our Blyder River Canyon population, it seems like one of our nest sites has been described as the, the, the beating heart of that population because year after year, they're the ones that are consistently producing chicks while other nest sites, like, like I said, we, uh, all the other territories we, we saw as active last year didn't seem to be producing chicks. So, I mean, you know, are those birds offspring of um, the actual nest that is producing chicks? You know, what's the relatedness within the population itself as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we just have two more questions left um, in the Q&A box. So Andrew Hall asks whether there's a preferred uh, compass direction of the cliff face where the titers are on ne nesting. Yeah. Now I have to remember. Um, I think the modeling showed that they prefer hot cliffs, um, interestingly. Mm. Um, and in terms of uh, what we found in Yasa, I'll have to go look at the data. I can't remember. Uh, I, I seem to remember uh, that sort of arrangement not holding up um, in the Nyasa area. Okay. Or that preference. Mm. Yeah, something to explore in, in the data. And then uh, one final question from Rob Simmons, um, and well, maybe not a question, but more uh, another suggestion for uh, your next survey, saying um, Angola has Nyombo woodlands and huge escarpments, so Titus. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Rob. Are you coming with? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. So um, I think. It's just gone eight o'clock. I see there a couple more questions popped in into the Q&A. I don't know if you want to uh, go through them. Um, yeah, uh, Gordon asks whether the population is decreasing or if it's always been a small population. Uh, is that an un a known unknown? <laughs> the South African one, he means. I'm not uh, sure. I it must be the whole um, one. Yeah. Yeah, well, the South African one has always been sort of a smaller population. I mean, um, 11 territories have been identified in total, and the maximum that have been sort of verified as active within a single year has been eight. Um, so it's always been the small population. That's sort of been the characteristic of the species, this, these tiny isolated populations um, being recorded or popping up um, uh, the end there. Okay, well, I think we're going to actually leave it there. It's eight o'clock. Uh, we don't like to keep people too long. So, uh, yeah, and I see Rob Simmons has, has commented in the chat box, uh, yes, on my way. So you'll have a volunteer <laughs> for, for your, your, <laughs> your next survey. Um, okay, excellent. <laughs> bring the funding, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always the, the tricky part. Um, but, yeah, I... Thanks again very much for your uh, your fascinating presentation. Is there anything else, any last words you'd like to share with the audience before we end off? Um, yeah, just thank you uh, for joining us and for listening. And uh, yeah, you can have a look at more of the projects I run on our website. And uh, yeah, please consider supporting them. Yeah, great. Well. Thanks very much again, and, and thanks very much to all the listeners uh, for joining us again for another Conservation Conversations. And uh, please do join us again next week uh, for our next uh, um, AV Tourism uh, talk. And uh, yeah, good night, everyone. Good night. Cheers, Christina. Thank you very much for hosting. Cheers. No problem.